Hello from Washington. I'm Nav Bahor Imamova at The Voice of America. Today I have Roger Kangas with us here from the National Defense University mm -hmm. where he is the Dean of the Near East and South Asia Center. Mm -hmm. Roger, Near East and South Asia, and then you focus on Central yeah. Asia. <laughs> How does that geography work at the National Defense yeah, University? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great title. Uh, no, the, the Near East South Asia Center or NISA Center is a um, one of the Department of Defense's regional centers. They all focus in different geographic areas. For us, it's North Africa, the Middle East, Central Asia, South Asia. Jokingly, we think it should be Mina Kasa, Middle East, North Africa, Central Asia, South Asia, but we'll condense it to That's Nisa. It's a huge area to it, cover. It is, it is a lot, uh, and, and it's, it's a region that, that straddles a number of our combatant commands. Uh, Central Command is our primary. Uh, uh, command of responsibility, but we also look into the Indian Ocean with Pacific Command or Indo-Pacific Command now. We look at Turkey, Israel, Palestine with European Command and of course North Africa with AFRICOM. They do have in common though is, is, is that these are regions that all are struggling with issues of, of uh, extremism, of, of, of border security, border stability, um, and it's a region that quite frankly is, is incredibly important to the United a States. Hot part it's a hot part of the, the world. world. Yeah. Yes. And the National Defense University, just so our audiences mm -hmm. know, is part of the Pentagon, Correct. the Defense yes. Department. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, Senior Professional Military Education uh, Center for the U.S. Department of Defense. And our research center, our regional center, we're fortunate to be tenants at National Defense University. Mm -hmm. And over the years, you have focused a lot on Central Asia, mm -hmm. even though you have a lot of other mm -hmm. countries and parts, uh, the, the regions of the world to focus on too. And even when the relations were not so good with Uzbekistan, mm -hmm. um, you used to travel to the mm -hmm. country. You have trained uh, Central Asian military. Mm -hmm. uh, and how, how does that work? How do you find time for Central Asia, let's say? Well, for me, the good news is Central Asia has, was, was my first introduction to this region, uh, uh, focusing on it still during the late Soviet period, being an academic researcher in the uh, early 1990s, and then later, uh, finally in the late 90s and early part of last decade, working with the Defense Department, having the opportunity to go back and, as you say, work with the militaries in the region, and, and up to you know a couple years ago, my last trip to Uzbekistan. So it's. It's, it's an area that I have a personal interest in, and I do see it fit well with the sorts of programs we do. Yeah, and how hard it is to, to really like maintain that focus on the region, because it's hard to, to have that yeah. steady focus, specifically on Central Asia, because you know a lot of us complain yeah. that U.S. doesn't pay enough attention to the region, but your center has always maintained that mm -hmm. steady focus. Yeah, it's, it, is, it, it can be difficult, I should say. It's often done with a limited budget and limited personnel, but we do try um, to keep these ties. Uh, we, we, we rely you know, heavily on our connections with not just our embassies in the region, but with the governments in the, you know, from Central Asia, their embassies here in Washington, D.C., um, and when we work with security cooperation efforts and with our engagement programs, you know, with our counterparts in the region. I mean, it's, it's, it's an ongoing process. We're fortunate to, to maintain these ties, uh, and it is a, a task we consider to be a high priority. And the military cooperation, military assistance uh, are some things that the governments can never say no in the yeah. region, right? But, I mean, it's one, though, that we, we, in terms of the U.S. Department of Defense, has to, I don't want to necessarily say justify, but we have to show the value added because let's remember the countries in the region, Uzbekistan in particular, have options and they can look to different, you know, in different directions. And so when they decide to work with the United States, we hope it's for the right reasons and we hope it's reasons that we share. And so then we can continue on those relations. Totally. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a lot I want to discuss mm -hmm. with you, starting with this new joint statement mm -hmm. between the United States and Uzbekistan, which mm -hmm. has launched a new era yeah. in strategic um, partnership. How, how, how important is this document? In my opinion, I think it's very important. Um, the notion of having a strategic partnership or a defined relationship with a country, um, not just an episodic ad hoc agree set of agreements, um, provides a roadmap. It provides uh, uh, opportunities, I should say, for both sides to figure out why should they engage with that country, what are the opportunities that are available, whether they're commercial interests, uh, uh, military interests, security interests, diplomatic interests. Uh, 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 
human interests in terms of university exchanges and other opportunities. And so I find that it, it sets a big framework. Now within it, both parties now have to figure out how to make it happen. Uh, you know, a, a document that lays out that both sides are interested in working with each other is fantastic, but making it happen requires the work of the staffs in both sides and people in both sides to, to continue to develop it. What was interesting, I mean, for me when I read this mm. as, a, as, a, as a news junkie, mm -hmm. uh, you know, policy junkie, in the first paragraph itself, you see a reference to 2002. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that strategic partnership, as you know, you mm -hmm. know, didn't work out the way yeah. it was envisioned, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, uh, to work. So when I asked about this from Ambassador Pamela Spratlin, mm -hmm. you know, to Uzbekistan, she said that, you know, that hope about 2002, mm -hmm partnership never died. I mean, we, we wanted we wanted to build on that. Mm -hmm. We didn't want essentially to trash it or to push it aside. Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, do you agree with that, with that you assessment? Know, I, I, I do agree with Ambassador Spratlin on this. And, and uh, in my view, and particularly as, as someone who was traveling in and out of the region during this time, Let's recall that this was shortly after the campaign in Afghanistan. Political era. Exactly, That's it was a diff era. different era. Um, there was a strong sense that a country like Uzbekistan was needed not just to help the U.S. provide security in Afghanistan. And of course, we look at basing opportunities. We look at uh, sort of the north-south commercial trade that could happen and the way to integrate Afghanistan with Central Asia. Uh, you know, it, it, it tied into a number of other U.S. interests, um, and so. In 2002, there was, I think, on both sides, a view that this is something not just even to build on, but that would really be sustained and would be a centerpiece of U.S. policy in the region. And some parts of it, one could argue, that worked or maybe yeah. continued or mm -hmm. was maintained, right? Yeah, and, and it's something I will say that, that the, the, the challenge that it, and maybe the lessons that it, it, it provides us is we perhaps looked at it differently. In, in how we saw this document and how we saw this relationship and how we define a strategic partnership. Perhaps the U.S. side was looking more at the strategic component. You know, we thought that Uzbekistan was important for our campaign in Afghanistan. From Tashkent's point of view, perhaps it was more about the partnership. It was this, you know, close friend mm -hmm. from the outside. I think we need to make sure in 2018 that we understand our positions a little more clearly. And I, and I think over time we're doing just that. And as you said, we, we, we've, we've worked on programs together since this, even when things haven't been uh, so positive between the U.S. and Uzbekistan, there have been areas of engagement. And so, quite frankly, there is a fair amount to build on. Yeah, and a lot of people in the Uzbek policy world actually mm -hmm. have been wondering about how do these strategic partnerships work? Mm -hmm. Like, what are the conditions? You know, it's one thing when presidents agree on things and you have <laughs> a joint statement, but as you yeah. earlier indicated, mm -hmm. that both systems now need to work. Now, you know, guys mm -hmm. and, you know, men and women who are in the, in the middle or lower echelons mm -hmm. of both governments have to do a lot of work. What are the main conditions for this to work, to be realized? Well, again, as I said, the, the main conditions are simply that, that we have an understanding of what the clear you know, parameters are, what, what can or what could be done. You look at the language and you say, ah, okay, we can focus on commercial opportunities or we can focus on you know, person to person exchanges. We can focus on security cooperation. The next step, as you said, is, is, is the people who have to make this happen through various meetings, uh, 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 you know, whether they're consultative staff talks or you know, opportunities for both sides to sit down and hammer out understandings of what each can and should do. But it requires that attention. It requires people devoting time to work on the Uzbek portfolio, this strategic partnership. You can't just have an agreement and put it on a shelf and say, oh, we'll, 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 we'll work it later. It reads beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it reads beautiful. No, you, you have to keep at it. You also have to resource it. You have to put people against it. You have to put money against it, uh, time. Uh, you have to understand that not every single thing will work out the first time that there may be setbacks. Uh, there may be commercial deals that don't quite work right because we haven't figured out legal regimes and requirements that could match. And so it takes patience. And, and I would say, as, as a final point, it also takes some continuity. Um, on the Uzbek side, that's probably less problematic because individuals do tend to keep positions perhaps for a longer period of time and will work, you know, U.S. issues or others. 
from the U.S. side, you know, we do have a rotation and a, an attrition of people coming in and out. And so, you know, we, we need to be mindful of lessons learned from past people who've held positions and keep these forward. Otherwise, we continually reinvent the wheel. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, as you just mentioned, uh, the, you know, U.S. Is, and Uzbekistan are now committed to work closely mm -hmm. on regional security reforms in Uzbekistan. They want to strengthen people-to-people -people ties. Economic cooperation mm -hmm. is a big part of it, and Uzbeks are very much interested in this. But military cooperation stands out mm -hmm. as something that U.S. is keenly interested, mm -hmm. and Uzbeks are very eager to work on it, mm -hmm. too. How can we envision that cooperation? Um, you know, it's interesting because you're right, this is a, it has been an area of, of, of engagement over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, whether, you know, again, relations have been, Consistent. yeah, whether relations have been very positive or where they've been challenged. Um, the amounts for security cooperation have varied. Uh, some years it was quite high, and one is thinking particularly, you know, 2002, 3, 4, um, other years where it was, was, was significantly lower, and then all points in between. But at the end of the day, Security cooperation from the U.S. side is how can we work with this partner, and in this case Uzbekistan, to further our interests in terms of counterterrorism, uh, uh, you know, uh, counter-trafficking efforts, uh, uh, looking at uh, regional challenges uh, that exist, uh, which unfortunately in this part of the world there are a few that affect not just us but the countries in the region. How can we build capacity? How can we build? Uh, you know, they use the term interoperability, but the opportunity for us to work with them, uh, you know, in a collaborative manner, how can we better equip them uh, if that's necessary? Um, and it may not be the most expensive, biggest, brightest items. It's what's important and sufficient for the task at hand. And so that sort of security cooperation takes time. What I find, as, and I will say this as a civilian watching this, I find that you know militaries across borders, you know, they understand each other. There is a common language, uh, and there is an understanding of what you know. How do you assess capabilities? How do you assess uh, uh, operations and tactics? Um, American military officers and personnel, and their Uzbek counterparts, um, and their other Central Asian counterparts, I think get this, and which is why it's an area of cooperation that's continued over time. You don't have much disagreement. <laughs> Not much. Uh, I mean, the, the challenges, though, are you know that that on occasion we find that we may we may find slightly different approaches to a region. We may want them to focus more on engagement with Afghanistan. They may realize that they also have to work with other partners that aren't you know quite on the same page as the U.S. Of course, thinking of the other larger powers in the region. And when we say military cooperation, mm -hmm. we also, I mean, we specifically mean border security, mm -hmm. uh, measures against uh, narco trafficking, mm -hmm. right? I mean, these are, as, these as, are as, also as, included. Yeah, exactly. I mean, mm -hmm. even though, you know, technically these might be different ministries, mm -hmm. you know, Ministry of Interior, Customs Services, Border Services, you know, the concept of security is, is, is pretty mm -hmm. broad here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So over the years, you have mm -hmm. trained Uzbek military, mm -hmm. you have studied the Uzbek military capability. Mm -hmm. How strong? Is Uzbekistan in this sphere? You know, it's, um, I, I should say, the capabilities are actually, you know, from, from an outside observer, the capabilities are actually better than what people might imagine. Uh, let's recall that this is a military that had to start from scratch. Uh, with the, 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 the breakup of the Soviet Union, the various uh, republics, now states, had their own militaries uh, uh, and it sort is of the developed. Biggest military it, in it, the region. It, yeah, they were fortunate to have a number of the headquarter capacity, you know, capabilities within Tashkent and, and, and other parts of Uzbekistan. Um, but in terms of equipment, in terms of sustaining their fighting force, uh, there were some serious challenges early on. And of course, it made sense to work with countries like Russia and with some of the immediate neighbors. Um, but over time, as the Uzbek military leadership has had to look at how to professionalize, you know, they've reached out to different areas. And in some, some capacities, um, you know, they've, they've done quite well. I mean, I would say overall they've been less, uh, uh, um, been, there's been actually less areas, of, fewer areas of cooperation between the Uzbeks and the U.S. on certain exercises or certain areas of development. But we've seen over the last few years, and I would actually say more like six or seven years, this has, has, has ramped up again. And so we're, you know, we're seeing opportunities for 
this kind of cooperation or professionalization. And it is step by step as we see a new generation of officers and, and personnel in the Uzbek military step into place, you know, their capabilities are increasing. I should also add that the uh, U.S. state of Mississippi is the, the National Guard partner uh, for Uzbekistan, and they've done a fantastic job of working with and helping to train uh, Uzbek military. And so we see these areas of development. I mean, fortunately, they haven't been tested to the fullest, and actually, I think most militaries hope they don't have to be. <laughs> <laughs> they're very discreet, and they prefer yes. to be very discreet. Yes. Like, you know, for mm -hmm. example, this partnership with the state of Mississippi, they, they rarely mention it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's been a it's been quite a, a productive relationship mm -hmm. so far. Mm -hmm. So as far as Uzbekistan is concerned, why do they want military assistance? What are their interests in this? Well, it's again, I I, I would look at it as 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 uh, um, you know, geography clearly plays a big role. Uh, but Afghanistan is not the biggest factor for no. Uzbeks, right? Um, it's sometimes perceived to be, at least uh -huh. my opinion, uh -huh. uh, that uh, it's the potential threats coming across the border. And you I mean, you're right, the, the good news is Afghanistan is a country that the challenges that exist are within its boundaries. Uh, we don't see as much of a spillover, you know, and, and sometimes you, you, know, you read in the literature and in some of the reports, you know, oh, there's a concern of spillover northward. It's something to be mindful of, but you're right, it's, it, it hasn't materialized as much. Um, but the notion of, of transnational extremist groups, terrorist groups, uh, this is a concern, and that, that requires a different kind of military or security force. The notion of Uzbekistan being invaded by another state is less of a concern because, again, the relations with the neighbors are, you know, quite frankly, much better. Uh, and that really wasn't a concern even in the past. And so they can focus on perhaps more non-traditional threats. Um, but I would say that those are the concerns if we think in terms of traditional or kind of hard security concerns for the country. How yeah. many uh, Uzbek officers have been trained by the United States so far? I mean, you would be the right person to ask uh, this question. Right. Roughly, you yeah. can give me the estimate. I was going to say. Can we say thousands? No, I, I think we're, we're still in the realm of high hundreds. But uh, um, in terms of, of multiple programs or, say, seminars or workshops in country, we would, be, we would be getting into those higher numbers, yeah. But you also train non-military part of the government, right? I mean, you, you mm -hmm. train diplomats, you train intelligence officers, you are, I mean, you, you're as, as well as, uh, uh, yeah, researchers yeah. and mm -hmm. academics mm -hmm. who periodically mm -hmm. attend our programs. Uh, and again, most of you know, these are sort of uh, short, you know, I would call it concise programs on specific topics. And so we're, we're fortunate to, to interact with a number of different ministries and departments. And, um, you know, for those, the network, and I would say both, uh, not just for the Near East South Asia Center, but for the George C. Marshall Center in Germany and other programs uh, in the U.S., you know, there have been opportunities to, to really work uh, closely with Uzbeks. Mm. Afghanistan. Mm. Uh, Afghanistan <laughs> seems very excited about this renewed interest in mm -hmm. it uh, by the, the governments in Central Asia, mm -hmm. and they seem to be promising a lot. Uh, they yeah. <laughs> they want to help, mm -hmm. you know, they want to help, they want to engage, uh, and this is obviously seen by the United States and by the rest of the international community as a really positive sign. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent can they deliver these promises to Afghanistan? Of course, the U.S. role here is very important, mm -hmm. U.S. assistance specifically. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, and I hate to say frustrating, that every year we say this is a critical year for Afghanistan. And I, I think we've been saying this now for 17 this is years. <laughs> yes. And uh, so if I start by saying this is a critical year for Afghanistan, it sounds like a, a repeating, a, you know, the same, same refrain. The current, it's not just the current U.S. strategy of South Asia and the, particularly the focus on Afghanistan, but increasingly it's something that we see coming out of Kabul itself. Success for Afghanistan requires regional cooperation. It's going to require the engagement of the neighboring states. This is something, it's not a new idea. It's something that's been around for quite a while. Uh, their concern, their challenge is, and I would say from Kabul, is there might be neighbors who have different interests in their country. Do they even like to see instability? Or at least not a strong Afghanistan. Um, fortunately, the Central Asian states have never been questioned. There's never been a concern out of Kabul of the Central Asian states, Uzbekistan, has a malign interest in our country. It's always been viewed in a positive way. 
often though in, an, in, a, in a limited way. You know, the understanding that you have countries that have their own concerns, their own interests, integrating in different ways, engaging in different ways. The focus southward has been minimal. Uh, this is changing, and I agree with you, that, that over, over time, we've seen over the last couple of years, the focus on Afghanistan has increased. You know, the, 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 the Tashkent summits or the meetings that have taken place, uh, potential peace processes, uh, opportunities to be a forum for discussion, this has all come up. Um, and I would say, you know, as, as, as an American, you know, I applaud this because the more opportunities that exist, the more venues that are there, the more uh, uh, chances for opposing sides to talk to each other, the better. Um, now, how do you move from having these conversations to actually doing something? Um, that's a big challenge. And unfortunately, that's an internal Afghan challenge. And I think we've seen in other long-term conflict situations, you know, and we can think whether it's Northern Ireland in the UK or Sri Lanka or the still ongoing uh, uh, issues in, uh, between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, um, you can have venues all over the world, uh, but until the people on the ground actually want them to happen, um, we're going to keep having a next set of meetings and a next one. So I applaud the opportunity and I applaud the interest. Uh, you know, let's see if the Afghans themselves, and, and of course it's not just the Afghan government, but the, uh, the opposition, um, if they can uh, come to some terms. But I would say and an interesting thing here is for the Central Asian states, uh, and again, as, as someone who's looked at this region for a, a while, I've usually seen it as, you know, the Amu Darya is a pretty wide river. Right. That the Central Asians look northward and eastward and westward, but not as much south. And the Afghans, uh, citizens of Afghanistan can look east and west and south, but not as much north. The north-south connection I actually do see increasing. Uh, the the um, if you want to say their version of a C5 plus one, right, of the Central Asian states plus Afghanistan or C5 plus Afghanistan is, in my opinion, a very positive step. Um, not just a, a symbolic one, but if, if you can start to see connections, and of course, you know, historically, culturally, linguistically, these connections do exist. But if you can start to see greater cooperation north-south, all the better, because this is going to be part of the economic development the energy development, the infrastructure development that's needed in Afghanistan. Um, realistically, if you know, if I, if I were to say ten years from now we can have this conversation again, I hope that that uh, at that point we really see true cooperation, engagement. But it is a long-term process. You know, right now the steps are being put into place, but it's going to take a while to actually make them happen. And as you said, Afghans have to help themselves yeah. before they uh, mm -hmm. aspire to be helped exactly. by, the, by the neighbors, yeah. basically. And, 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 it's, and I think it's, it's critical for the legitimacy of the process. As, you know, as, as the U.S., NATO, other international actors have been engaged for the longest time, and I think with all the good intentions, um, perhaps we've not seen quite the success because there have been differences on the ground. Uh, things maybe you know, haven't worked out the way we'd like because different agendas, different priorities and capacities. And, and, and of course, you know, a lot of our expectations maybe early on were too, um, too high, mm -hmm. uh, too immediate. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we like to have things done yesterday <laughs> and we're in a region that it takes time. It you know, takes so, time, yeah. uh, I mean, it takes a lot of time in Washington, too. <laughs> it, well, on other things, it definitely takes a lot yes, of time. Yes. <laughs> and we hear that NATO is actually is, is reviewing, mm -hmm. as usual, obviously, you mm -hmm. know, reviewing its strategy towards the region. Mm -hmm. Because about a couple of years ago, they kind of stopped their activities yeah. in the region. They, they nearly closed their office mm -hmm. in, in Uzbekistan. So with the new leadership in Uzbekistan, everybody s seems to be renewing their yeah. attitude um, to the country. So you saw President President Mirziyoyev, when yeah. he was here mm -hmm. uh, last month, you listened to him uh, mm -hmm. from up close. What did you think of him? How did he do in Washington? I thought he did well. Uh, this was a, um, a visit that wasn't, you know, didn't have the lead planning or the planning time, the uh, lead time that most people would assume for a presidential visit. Um, you know, when the decision was made to come to Washington to when it actually happened uh, it was a fairly short time. and. With that time, you know, it seemed almost every minute, every second was used. Um, you know, high-level meetings, other public events, and, and, and really a chance to engage. 
I think from, you know, from his point of view, if he wanted to come here and, and, and make a statement uh, that he you know, is interested in working with the U.S. and is interested in a range of issues that Americans are interested in, you know, great success. From the American side, I would say, and, and, and you know, whether it's uh, political actors or perhaps some of the, you know, the business community, um, their reactions have been quite positive. You know, it's, oh, maybe there's more opportunities again. Maybe we can revisit these engagements, you know, person-to-person -person opportunities. And so you see, you know, a fairly, what I would call low-cost, high-yield uh, visit. You know, he, his, his mission, I should say, was, was a success. Now, the, again, the question, as we've said before, is can they follow up? Can the good words that were said be followed up with actions? And, and I think that, that's what we're now going to have to look at. Uh, and so I'm hoping, you know, as, 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 I, as I watch this and as others watch it, that we start to see specific steps being made, whether it's commercial opportunities are uh, uh, made available or at least uh, uh, the chances are there for American companies or other companies uh, to engage in Uzbekistan, that we start to see, you know, more university students going back and forth between the countries as they used to. Be. I mean, as, as one who, you know, as one myself, I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I would love to see these opportunities uh, uh, reemerge, um, and just the the, the the communications, the higher level visits back and forth, and and we are seeing this. I, I, I think you're going to see more American political actors interested in going to Uzbekistan, where perhaps, as as you know, some years back. Uh, we would go some time between visits. Right, um, yeah, you know, like on your way to or exactly. from Afghanistan, a nice stop, yeah, you know, in Samarkand and Bukhara. Yes, and, <laughs> and actually you, that's, that's a good point because hopefully this also means we're looking at Uzbekistan for Uzbekistan. And, and I would say being, you know, maybe a little self-critical is we've often looked at Uzbekistan and the other neighbors with respect to something else, with respect right. to our engagement with yeah. Russia or yeah. Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah. Those are factors to look at, but it would be nice to see the country and, and, and see opportunities both ways, simply as relationships between two countries. You know, every time Central Asia is referred as a bridge, mm -hmm. uh, the governments just uh, hate that. They don't, <laughs> they like they don't want to be a bridge. They no. don't want the region to be a bridge. They, yeah. they, want, they, they want the region to be the region as mm -hmm. it is, you know. Wow, we could we could continue okay. this conversation uh, for for a long time. But thank you so much for being here, for talking to us, for sharing your insights. Hey, you're welcome. That was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching us. I'm Nabohor Imamova in Washington.